from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Tomoko Steen. Uh, I work at the Library of Congress as a research specialist, and focusing on this topic today is uh, very close to my heart as well. I've been to Fukushima a few times and I worked with some scientists over there, both physicists and uh, biologists. So um, we are very fortunate to have the wonderful speaker, Edwin Ryman, Dr. Edwin, Edwin Ryman. He is an expert in the uh, nuclear security and especially Fukushima. We have, the, uh, as you can see in the book back there, uh, he's a really uh, known in the field, but he knows the topic very much. So Dr. Ryman have a PhD from Cornell and that's how I actually my former friend introduced me to him, and we are very lucky that you know learning from both sides, biological and uh, physics side of uh, this uh, sad tragedy of the uh, nuclear accident. Before further ado, I just to um, introduce our speaker, Dr. Lyman. We have a book here. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, good morning, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming out on a um, very cold day to listen to a story about a disaster. It's not, <laughs> wouldn't have been my choice, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, so today I'd like to talk about Fukushima, and um, we're coming up to the fourth anniversary, so it's worth another round of uh, introspection about what it means. But in particular, I also want to talk about its lessons for nuclear safety here. And where is page down? OK. Right. OK. Um, <clears throat> the main question that we have, the organization I work for, which is the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, is really why should we care here in the United States? And that's the focus of a lot of the questions we get here among our membership. But our main point is that if we don't give it sufficient attention, we do believe that it's only going to be a matter of time before we see a similar event in the United States. And just looking at the population of US nuclear plants, we see plants that are vulnerable to catastrophic nuclear disasters. They may not be exactly the same uh, type of accident that precipitated uh, what happened in Fukushima, but what really matters is whether, is how the plants were designed built compared to the threats that they withstand today. And we see a gap there which is very troubling. Nuclear plants are vulnerable to multiple system failures and they are, uh, the threat of a large terrorist attack is something which also requires significant attention because no matter how safe a nuclear plant is intrinsically against accidents, a knowledgeable uh, team of saboteurs could figure out a way to unravel those protections. When we look at U.S. plants compared to the Japanese plants before the Fukushima accident, we don't see a significant difference in the level of preparation of the plants here, the attention of the regulators, or the seriousness of the industry to deal with these types of questions. Uh, the same type of denial uh, is very much in evidence even today here in the United States. That also can be seen when you look at the state of emergency planning uh, to cope with the aftermath of, of an accident like Fukushima. We don't think that the US is uh, any better prepared than the Japanese were to cope with this severe disaster with long lasting and unpredictable effects on human health and the environment. So uh, we do think that it is definitely relevant here in the United States. 
So uh, our book, um, Fukushima, The Story of a Nuclear Disaster, which I wrote with my colleague at UCS, David Lockbaum, and also a very accomplished um, journalist, Susan Stranahan, uh, came out. We're approaching the year anniversary of the book. And it um, took us about two years to write. Um, we did quite a lot of research, and including interviews with nuclear regulatory uh, commission officials. And one uh, core part of the book was uh, information from Freedom of Information Act requests against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, Office of Science and Technology Policy, and other agencies, which really uh, provided a wealth of information about what was going on behind the scenes here in the United States in response to the Fukushima accident. And that really helped to illuminate uh, some of the uh, confusion and the uh, reasons for some of the decisions that were made here in the United States. We got um, a pretty good notice of reviews for the book um, on uh, Amazon or other sites, there were some critics who had had some complaints. And one of the co common complaints was the book was called Fukushima, but it looks like half the book is about you know the U.S. and the nuclear, nuclear regulatory commission, the history of nuclear regulation. What's what's the deal? You know, boring. And um, <laughs> I, you know, I respect their opinion, but I think that is a uh, kind of missing the point of the book because uh, really, uh, what we try to show is that. It's the history of, of denial and the it can't happen here attitude, which not only informed the development of the nuclear industry here in the U.S., but also uh, played a big role uh, around the world. In fact, the Japanese nuclear industry and its regulators uh, did look to the U.S. over the decades for guidance about what to do uh, to deal with uh, severe accident issues, and we think they got the wrong message. So we do think that you can draw a line between what happened here in the United States and the debate over uh, nuclear power and what ultimately ended up happening in Japan. I guess I'd just like to um, start out. Here's the laser pointer. A little description of the General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor. Because this um, is the, there are five of the six reactor units at Fukushima Daiichi were of this type. It's one of the earliest light water reactor designs. And it suffers from certain flaws which did contribute to the severity of the accident. So, just a little tutorial here. In a nuclear power plant, a light water reactor, meaning that the coolant is ordinary light water, just H2O. Um, the fuel is typically uranium dioxide in a ceramic form that is contained, uh, formed into pellets. Those pellets are stacked into long rods clad in an alloy uh, with the metal zirconium. It's called zircaloy. And those rods are stacked, uh, combined into fuel assemblies, and then arranged in the reactor core. That reactor core uh, is, well, there's a frame which suspends the fuel, and that's contained in a, what's called a pressure vessel, which is a steel uh, shell about a few inches thick at its thickest point, um, which keeps the primary coolant, that is the water that's used to cool the reactor fuel, uh, uh, contained. Outside of the reactor vessel, in this Mark I boiling water reactor, is a structure called a primary containment. And in the Mark I, there are two pieces of that. One is this upside down incandescent light bulb-like thing, which is called the dry well. And that is a thin, leak-tight steel shell with a, a layer of concrete on the outside. You can't see it here. Um, but the primary purpose of the dry well is to prevent the leakage of radioactivity from the core in the event that there's an accident which causes damage to the fuel. In addition to the dry well, 
There's also a structure at the bottom of this reactor, which is called the torus or the wet well. And that's typically about half filled with water and is shaped like a donut or a torus. Now, this, the dry well and the wet well together are called the primary containment in the Mark I. And it's a type of reactor uh, called a pressure suppression containment. And if you know, if you think of a nuclear reactor, uh, typical vision is something with a very large dome-shaped containment building. Those are pressurized water reactors, and about two-thirds of the reactors in the United States are pressurized water reactors, with most of them having what are called large uh, dry containments. They have a lot of capacity to absorb uh, the en energy that would occur if you had an accident where you could not uh, control the heat generation of, of the fuel. But, uh, and those are primarily made by Westinghouse. That was the model of the first uh, commercial nuclear reactor. But General Electric, which was a competitor of Westinghouse, had a better idea. They thought, well, the cost of that containment, you know, it's a large reinforced concrete building with a robust steel liner, very expensive, maybe 20% of the co capital cost of a nuclear power plant. Maybe we can save money on that containment uh, by shrinking down the containment to this little light bulb shell here. If we have another structure, and that's the purpose of the wet well, which would, we would use to condense steam if we started to generate more steam than we could handle in an accident. So instead of trying to build a building which could withstand the, that steam pressure, we'd have the system where we would condense, we'd pipe the steam into this torus where it would be condensed back into water, and therefore the steam pressure in the dry well would never get that high, and therefore that was the theory behind shrinking the, the containment to this small size and saving money on all that concrete and steel. That wasn't such a good design idea, and the way Fukushima unraveled um, is a demonstration of that, which we will talk about. Uh, the other aspect of a boiling water reactor is that um, the water that's pumped through the core is allowed to boil, and uh, some of it that uh, turn some of it is turned into steam. The steam is then pumped out and directly used to power or to drive the turbines, which generate electricity. Then, after the steam has done that, it's condensed back into water and cycled back into the into the core. Now, on March 11, 2011, a very large earthquake, I think the largest that Japan ever experienced, magnitude of about nine on the Richter scale, caused all six boiling water reactors at the site to lose off-site electrical power because the earthquake caused the transmission lines to uh, fail, collapse, and the site lost power. Now, nuclear power plants are generally designed to deal with that event, a loss of off-site power. Nuclear power plants don't do very well when they don't have an outside or an external source of electricity, because it may be paradoxical, but nuclear power plants need a preferred independent source of electricity to operate most of their safety systems. You don't rely on the power generated by the plant itself to operate safety systems that it needs because that could lead to some dangerous feedback loops. So you generally require off-site power uh, to power safety systems, but if you lose off-site power, you have backup diesel generators. And those six reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, there were 13 emergency diesel generators, and they all started up normally. So if that were the end of story, we wouldn't be here today. But the, as, probably most people know, there was the second punch of the one-two punch. So less than an hour later, the site was inundated with a tsunami, which was 45 or 50 feet high, um, which inundated the site. And that flooding caused failure of most of the electrical equipment, not only the generators, but also the electrical distribution system that carry the electricity from the generators to uh, uh, where they were needed in the plant. 
and that led to essentially a loss of all alternating current power to those reactors, except for some batteries uh, which uh, were obtained under emergency conditions, um, which operated for some period of time after the initial accident, and that those batteries um, were used to power certain instrumentation and control systems, but otherwise the plant was in what was called a, a station blackout. And nuclear power plants don't do very well if they don't have any electrical power at all, because not only do you not have the electrical power needed to drive uh, pumps and, and motors, but you also don't have lighting, you don't have um, control systems operable, um, you don't have power for uh, ventilation, uh, you are essentially flying blind. And here's a picture of how that site was inundated. So at uh, Fukushima Daiichi, the uh, plant was built on a cliff, but the cliff was actually mechanically, they, they excavated it to lower it um, because they had their ultimate heat sink. In other words, where all that excess waste heat was generated, when you generate electricity, you have waste heat, that had to be uh, cooled by the ocean. And so they had seawater pumps at the, uh, at the coastline. Those pumps helped to reject this excess or this waste heat from the plant. And it was more efficient uh, if you didn't want to pump uh, seawater up to the top of a cliff, so it was more efficient to lower the cliff height to enable that, uh, those pumps to be used more efficiently. Um, in addition, most of the uh, emergency equipment, including the diesel generators here and the electrical switch gear and the batteries were below grade, but they were still well above uh, sea level. And the purpose of putting that equipment below grade partly was seismic protection because there's less vibration generally uh, for underground structures and the biggest concern uh, was the seismicity of, of the site. The potential for tsunamis was in great dispute and it was not at all clear uh, at the time of the accident that that historically the area around Fukushima Daiichi had been subject to tsunamis of such great height. There was technical uncertainty about it and regulators, nuclear regulators, whether they're in Japan or they're in the United States or anywhere else, tend to be rather conservative about changing, making major changes to safety requirements based on uncertain scientific information. So I think I've discussed this. If you only have DC battery power, you can maintain some of your instrumentation controls. Also in the boiling water reactors, um, some of the, uh, uh, except for unit one at Fukushima Daiichi, these boiling reactors had a, another emergency system, which was called the reactor core isolation cooling system, or BRICSI, in, in industry parlance. And this is a system that actually was able to use the steam generated by the reactor uh, to drive a, a pump or a turbine and pump water and actually remove heat from the core just based on the steam that was being generated. So you didn't need an electrically powered motor uh, to operate that system. But you did need to be able to throttle it. You needed some control over it because you couldn't just leave uh, this steam-driven uh, cooling system to run on its own accord, or at least the belief was you couldn't do that. You needed to be able to control it, and if you didn't control it, it wasn't, it was eventually going to stop working. So the belief was that that RICSI system could function as station blackout, uh, but you needed to have at least DC power your control room and the ability to throttle the turbine speed, and if you couldn't do that, then after some period of time, a few hours, it would stop working as well. So when you lose DC power and you lose your electrical circuits and you lose your seawater pumps, you essentially have no way to remove heat from the reactor core. And in that case, you eventually will have uh, a meltdown. 
and that meltdown will occur unless you come up with some way of getting cooling water into the core uh, as uh, rapidly as possible. So when they lost all their installed cooling systems at Fukushima, the uh, personnel at the site tried to come up with a, an emergency plan on the fly because they had no emergency plan that actually covered that type of situation. They simply did not ever expect to encounter a, a station blackout for such a long period of time. So they went to, um, they had some portable power supplies um, that were delivered to the site, but they couldn't actually plug them in because most of the electrical distribution, the power panels were shorted out, so they had no place to actually connect it. They had to try to find uh, functioning electrical circuits, and that took time. They had uh, diesel-powered fire pumps, which they recruited not for fire protection, but to try to inject water directly into the cores of the melting reactors. Uh, they had fire engines also that were on site for fire uh, protection. They, they recruited them to try to pump water into the core. Um, but because that wasn't a standard procedure, uh, they really didn't have any uh, well-established way to, to do that or to figure out whether it was actually working. So it was ad hoc. They were uh, pumping water in, but they didn't actually know if it was getting into the core. In fact, now we now know that most of it actually never reached the core, uh, of, at least of the Unit 1 reactor, which is the first one to melt down. The other uh, challenge in a Mark 1 boiling water reactor is dealing with the containment. And as I showed you, that little dry well, that primary containment, um, r requires proper functioning of the pressure suppression system or the dry well will overpressurize and, and leak and eventually uh, potentially rupture. So the, um, if you aren't able to remove heat through your normal cooling systems by pumping water through the core uh, efficiently, there's only one other way to remove heat from, that, from the containment system, and that's what's called venting. You can open a vent and release steam into the environment. And that was generally considered a last resort because that steam could be radioactive and it would mean a decision to vent would mean a decision to deliberately release radiation to the environment, which no one wants to do. But in this situation, uh, venting turned out to be essential. Uh, but however, in the case of the first reactor, uh, Unit 1, um, the decision to vent was delayed for various reasons. Some say it's political, it was also technical. They didn't ac actually know how to do it. They had to find blueprints to figure out the way the vent uh, path would actually operate. And turned out you needed to open um, manually some of the valves, uh, at least two valves in alignment, to be able to operate the vent successfully. And they couldn't do that from the control room because the uh, the uh, the loss of electrical power means you couldn't open the valve uh, from uh, remotely. So they had to send teams actually to where the valves were to try to manually open them. And the problem was at that by the time they made the decision to do that, uh, those areas in some cases were so radioactive that it was uh, very hazardous for personnel uh, to actually do it. So they had a delay in venting. Uh, that means the containment pressure uh, in Unit 1 uh, rose unacceptably high. It forced radioactive steam out the top of the dry well. Now, there's a lid on the dry well that's bolted and sealed, but the pressure caused the lid to actually rise and the seals were strained and they start to leak. So radioactive gas actually leaked into the reactor building and that was actually something I forgot to mention. Let me just go back to that. There's also a secondary containment around the structure, which is a concrete, ordinary con reinforced concrete building, but not designed to be leak tight, not designed to be explosion resistant. In fact, it's in, it, there, there are what are called blowout panels at the top of the building, which were intended to deliberately open if the pressure increased too much in that building. So the reactor building is not really a containment at all. 
Uh, but what happened when the dry well leaked is that you had radioactive steam going into the reactor building and um, that eventually led to radiological release to the environment. And how did that happen? So the, here are some pictures of what they tried to do. Fukushima with fire engines, you see the condition of the site uh, was uh, extremely hazardous. At night, uh, there was flooding, there were live electrical wires, there were manhole covers that were, had been washed out, but you couldn't see them. Um, there was earthquake debris everywhere. And so under those conditions, they tried very hard to do something that no one had ever done before. So it's amazing, actually, that the accident wasn't worse than it was. Um, but they did manage to delay uh, core damage in two of the three reactors for several days. Now what happens when you lose cooling water to reactor fuel? Um, I said that this is an example of a fuel rod. Uh, you had uranium uh, pellets clad in a zirconium alloy. But that zirconium, if the fuel rod overheats, then the gas inside will, uh, will expand it will cause the rod to swell, it will cause the fuel rod to rupture, and the fuel itself is, uh, at that point, after being in a reactor for a while, is in pieces. Uh, there's fission gas, which then escapes from the rod. Eventually, uh, the entire rod will uh, fracture and start to melt. Now, the other thing about fuel uh, nuclear fuel is that the zirconium alloy that's a common, uh, it's, it's what is the standard, is very good from the point of view of normal reactor operation. It has a lot of good properties. But it doesn't do so well if you lose cooling for too long because once it heats up to a certain temperature, it actually will start to, to burn or oxidize. And in what's called an autocatalytic reaction, it will generate heat. And so the zirconium, if you let the zirconium heat up to a certain temperature, then it will start generating heat on its own, continue to cause increased heat uh, generation, which will eventually cause melting of the entire core. And if this process goes on to completion, the core will, uh, uh, will melt into a lava-like structure, and that will then slump to the bottom of the reactor vessel. And you have a heated molten salt, which eats through steel very efficiently. And so eventually, um, that core, that molten core, can rupture the, or melt through the bottom of the reactor vessel and end up on the floor of the containment. And then the only thing uh, that's preventing radiological release to the outside is the integrity of the containment. But we heard already that the containment was leaking from the top. So uh, it's content, it uh, was already violated. Now the other variable here in, in uh, a boiling water reactor is, is the spent fuel pool. Now the spent fuel from the reactor is, once it's been uh, used, you know, exhausted its useful life, it's then removed and put into a swimming pool at the top of the reactor building. In boiling water reactors, that pool sits uh, five floors above the ground. And um, that is, again, a design issue which turned out to have serious implications in Fukushima. Now, the spent fuel requires cooling as well. Even though the fuel has been out of the reactor uh, for some period of time, because of what's called decay heat, uh, that fuel will continue to generate heat for a very long period of time, and you need to continue to Apply, uh, supply cooling to it, um, uh, or that fuel itself could become endangered. Now, generally, the industry has thought that's a longer-term issue, uh, and you don't have to worry about the spent fuel pool at the beginning of an accident because you'd have a week or a couple of weeks before you would, that fuel would heat up to the point that it would become a problem. But it turns out Fukushima, they didn't actually know what was going on in spent fuel pools. They didn't have any indicators available to tell them where the water level was, and there were some troubling signs that maybe the spent fuel pools themselves were in trouble, 
and that could have led to a much larger uh, release of radioactivity if the spent fuel pools had been actually uh, uh, had experienced a fire themselves. Now, it turned out that didn't happen, but they didn't know that for weeks after the accident. This is what happens to a spent fuel pool assembly if you had a, a fire in a spent fuel pool. The rods themselves will become, will disintegrate, and uh, essentially the spent fuel could lose almost all uh, of its long-lived radioactivity or a particular isotope called cesium-137. So what are the consequences of what happened at Fukushima? Well, in summary, we had three reactor cores which melted down, which melted through the reactor vessel, which ended up on the floor of the containment, possibly breaching the containment in certain spots, but that's not even known today. There were two spent fuel pools where there were close calls. Turns out uh, the spent fuel pools never actually experienced fires, but again, they didn't know that for several weeks. And it was the confusion of what was going on in the spent fuel pools that led to a distraction from dealing with the reactors themselves. There were massive releases of radiation both into the air and into the water. There are ongoing environmental hazards at and around the site today. Over 150,000 people were displaced from their homes, uh, and uh, most of whom have not been able to return. And it has damaged the economy of Japan from agriculture, the fishing industry, to the nuclear industry because every power reactor in Japan, a uh, country that was heavily dependent on nuclear energy, um, is shut, was shut down and still shut down today. So what, what are the greatest concerns when you have a reactor meltdown? Probably the biggest immediate concern is an isotope called iodine-131, which is produced in copious amounts when a reactor is operating, but as long as the fuel remains intact, it's not an environmental hazard. But because iodine sublimates, it's a gas at room temperature, it escapes, and if you have fuel damage, it can get into the environment readily. Uh, luckily, it only has an eight-day half-life, meaning it only persists in the environment for probably about three months. Um, cesium-137 is another fission product which is uh, of great concern, uh, but it has a 30-year half-life, meaning it persists in the environment for several hundred years if it's not remediated. And um, that is what contributes to the long-term environmental hazard after radioactive release. It's now known that the iodine-131 released from Chernobyl has caused over 6,000 thyroid cancers in children, and the cesium-137 in the environment is the reason why there's still an exclusion zone around Chernobyl and, and now one uh, around Fukushima. Now, one of the interesting things is what the threat to Americans actually was. It was, uh, we know the U.S. government, um, about five days after the accident, advised Americans um, in Japan to uh, evacuate from within 50 miles around Fukushima. Now, this was an issue both in Japan and the United States. In Japan, at that time, the Japanese authorities were only uh, enforcing a 12-mile evacuation zone. So this made it seem as if the U.S. was somehow disregarding uh, the Japanese own recommendations to, their, to the people. But also back home, um, the U.S. standard for evacuation planning is that we have a 10-mile emergency evacuation zone around a nuclear plant. So the industry here was up in arms about the idea that somehow uh, that might be called into question by this decision. So the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission didn't make many friends, either in the State Department or the industry back here, uh, but ultimately it turned out to be the right call in our view, as we'll see. Uh, at that time, there was also concern that Americans might be endangered much further away from 50 miles. Tokyo is about 130 miles away from the site. Uh, they were running calculations that seemed to imply that according to U.S. standards, you might want to evacuate the uh, U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. 
Then the government was also running models that found that children in the west coast of the United States might actually be endangered if they drank milk uh, that was contaminated with radioactive iodine, uh, that it could actually trigger thresholds for uh, uh, interdiction of milk, even in the west coast of the United States. And that was based on worst case in the book we go through a lot of how the U.S. government was arguing about what the worst case actually was and what to assume. Uh, President Obama uh, did not want to reassure the American people one day and then have to come back and say we're going to be uh, interdicting milk supplies. So uh, the White House was very interested in getting what they believed was the worst case picture from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission itself never deals in worst cases because they've convinced themselves that there's no such thing as a worst case, that uh, you don't regulate based on worst cases, and they were very resistant to that. Um, and that led to a delay in actually figuring out what to do. But here's one example from one of our uh, FOIA documents which showed that uh, in the white region there, this. This is the Fukushima site, and that's uh, Tokyo. And this was the, they considered a scenario where there were two spent fuel pools on fire and the wind uh, essentially blowing in one direction, which uh, for 12 hours or so, which actually didn't happen, but this is what they considered the worst case. And then it looked like uh, under EPA, Environmental uh, Protection Agency guidelines, the uh, Tokyo would be in the region where you'd want to evacuate, and that would have been a major, major uh, disaster if that were the case. The worst case didn't come to pass, but no one really knew at that time whether it would or wouldn't. Ultimately, the iodine cesium releases were much smaller than worst case. In fact, were still believe still believed that they were smaller than what happened in Chernobyl accident. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent of the Chernobyl releases uh, to the atmosphere, but that's still plenty bad enough. And uh, one of the major environmental consequences of the accident was a very unfortunate confluence of events where there was a large release of radioactivity from one of the reactors, and I still don't know which one or exactly when it happened, but that occurred when the wind started to blow toward the northwest, and there was also uh, fog and other uh, precipitation. And that caused uh, a contaminated plume all the way out 25 or 30 miles away from the site, uh, uh, past the village of Itate. And so you can see that the 50-mile recommendation made by the United States was not such a bad idea, given this level of contamination going out at least 25 or 30 miles, that was probably a good call. In fact, because the Japanese themselves did not believe that there would be significant danger to people living that far away, they did not actually consider the possibility there would be a need to evacuate uh, the village of Itate and other areas out there for about a month after the accident. So this led to um, it wasn't until the International Atomic Energy Agency came and started to make measurements there that they realized uh, there was a problem. In fact, they did evacuate those areas after people had been living in unacceptably uh, high contamination for weeks. So what's the situation today? Okay. Well, the reactors are in what are called cold shutdown, meaning that they're no longer above the boiling point of water, so you're not generating a lot of steam. But every day, uh, a considerable amount of water is being pumped through the reactors and, and the remaining spent fuel pools. And um, a lot of that water is escaping through the holes that were generated during the meltdowns and ending up uh, under the reactors in the uh, soil in the basements beneath the reactors. Now that's a problem because the site, uh, because of its uh, hydrology, every day there's groundwater flow coming from the hills and washing to the sea. And so that groundwater flow 
is continually mingling with the contaminated water that's accumulating under the site, and some of that is being washed into the sea. So that is the currently the biggest environmental problem at the site, is how to deal with this, not only the inventory of contaminated water they already have, but water every day that's being uh, contaminated and threatens, uh, threatens the ocean. So they've come up with, they're trying to pump and treat water, but they can't pump at all. Uh, so they have a plan which is currently under construction to build what they call an ice wall, essentially sinking thousands of pipes uh, in a barrier around the site, which they will then fill with coolant and try to freeze the soil in an attempt to try to get water, uh, groundwater to be diverted around the site, but it's not at all clear that's going to work. So the ultimate cost, maybe 20 billion decommissioning, no one really knows, remediation of the contaminated areas, paying compensation could be another 100 billion, and there's still 120,000 people who are still displaced. If you look at the uh, estimates that have been generated to date, uh, the contamination, both the exposure to the uh, population of evacuees before they evacuated, plus long-term exposures, uh, most of which have yet to be incurred, of people living in uh, areas which are slightly contaminated, but what the government considers acceptable for habitation, that ultimately the toll will be thousands of cancer deaths. But the good news is most of that is still exposures which have not yet been received. So depending on the decisions made by the government, they could avoid a lot of that exposure, but it looks like that's not going to be happening. So, as usual, I have much more than I have time for, but um, the question of can it happen here is the, is the one that we keep coming back to, and we think the attitude of complacency is as, as prevalent here as it is in Japan. Um, we portray in the book a hearing uh, in the Senate a year after the Fukushima accident, where the commissioners lined up, four of the five nuclear regulatory commissioners lined up and said they don't think anything like Fukushima could happen here in the United States. I consider that the sort of nicotine is an addictive moment of the, uh, uh, this is former Commissioner Magwood just saying he doesn't think it could happen. He's now director of the Nuclear Energy Agency uh, of the OECD in Paris. Um, so if you're a regulator and that's your bottom line belief, if you really don't believe it can happen, you're going to make decisions in accordance with that belief. And unfortunately, that's the way we think a lot of the decisions have, have played out. When you're addressing the question, how safe is safe enough, um, a regulator has to grapple with the question of how do you draw the line, um, how safe do you think is sufficient, uh, with regard to the protection against external events like earthquakes or floods, uh, and also all the concomitant requirements that go into safety. How rigorously do you have to, does the paperwork have to be done? How rigorously do you have to inspect and maintain equipment? How do you have to test plans to make sure they work? All that follows from how seriously you take this kind of an accident. And, um, I'm going to just cut to the chase here. Anyway, so we have a lot of plants in the United States that are in areas that are downstream of large dams. And the consideration of a massive dam failure was not included in the siting decisions or the flooding protections that were put into place when those plants were originally licensed and built. It simply was not assumed that an upstream dam could fail. But now uh, there was internally a lot of dispute about how to deal with these plants as people realized that maybe this was a possibility. After the 9-11 attacks, when the federal government started to worry about uh, catastrophic attacks on domestic infrastructure, this became an issue. And there's uh, one plant in South Carolina called Oconee. It's one of the two three-unit uh, plants here in the United States that are operating. That site could be completely inundated by an upstream dam failure 
And from internal NRC emails, we know that right after Fukushima, the staff was circulating back and forth uh, their concern that, that that could be the site of an American Fukushima should such a dam failure occur. Um, so I'm just going to, right. So just one example. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been grappling with how to answer the question of how safe is safe enough since Fukushima. And one key issue is how do you deal with plants like Oconee, which face external hazard risks much greater than what they were designed to withstand, whether seismic or flooding. Turns out almost every plant in the country uh, is vulnerable in that way to some external hazard which is greater than what they were designed for. So the question is, do you force those plants to retrofit um, to actually meet the new or what's called reevaluated hazard, or do you try to do it in a half-baked way? And so we think the NRC's, uh, the staff has recently proposed the, the half-baked way, which was not to require what's called design basis protection to increase. That is the fundamental safety basis of nuclear plants in this country. Um, uh, that you don't upgrade that, but you have emergency equipment in place, should it happen, that you can then bring to bear to try to mitigate that accident. So these are the kinds of fire pumps and other emergency measures that you would employ after your site is completely inundated by floodwaters. So essentially you're saying that we can beef up that post-tsunami response, like what we saw at Fukushima, and make it more effective. That, so it can deal with these, what we call beyond design basis accidents, and we don't need to actually increase the fundamental safety hardening of the plants. And that's a cheaper way. It's the way the industry would prefer. And right now there's a controversy brewing in the NRC. A number of staff have dissented from this proposal. Uh, they think that you don't want to put all your reliance on what's called mitigation after an accident happens, but you want to have uh, protection in place from the beginning. And so the commission is now deliberating on whether to uh, how to resolve this issue. But the fact is there are some plants out there today that probably there's nothing you could do uh, to protect them uh, against hazards that they, uh, they could face. So they would really have to shut down if you made that decision. And that's not something the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been in the business of doing for decades, is actually requiring a plant to shut down because it's unsafe. Um, so that they're going to do everything possible to avoid coming to that kind of a conclusion. And so that is sort of where we are today on the cusp of do we really learn the lessons of Fukushima? And I'll just cut to the chase. You know, do we actually require that plants have margins to safety limits that take into account the uncertainties about uh, what we know and don't know about the risks they face? Uh, do we build in additional what's called conservatism, uh, again, to deal with these uncertainties? The French are doing something differently than what we're doing. They're saying we should have the French plants will have equipment in place which is going to be designed to more stringent standards than the rest of the reactor. So that equipment would actually be there if that plant experienced a beyond design basis accident. But the US, that's an expensive proposition. The U.S. is not going in that direction. So in summary, we, our judgment is Fukushima was not a Japanese accident. It was an accident that happened to occur in Japan, but it could really happen anywhere. That unless the regulators and the industry abandon this mindset of it can happen here uh, and apply Fukushima's lessons here at home, then the credibility of nuclear power possibly will suffer a, another blow, which might be fatal to the whole industry. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm sorry if I've gone on a little long. So. Any questions?
Do you want me to? Okay. Uh, Miles. Uh, yeah. How many damages uh, the cost of Fukushima? Is there any total estimate uh, beyond the 100 billion in dimensions or restitution? I would say no, not at this point, because there, yeah, the question was, are there any reliable, really reliable estimates of the total cost? I mean, you have to, first of all, define what you're going to include, because there are a lot of indirect impacts that you can estimate, you know, the impacts on the, on the Japanese economy, on the global economy. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't think anyone has a good, methodology for, for doing that except crudely. But, um, you know, when you're talking about damages already over $100 billion, you're talking about something which is, you know, well beyond uh, uh, any other natural disaster. So, um, so it's already, and, and it's um, well beyond what the U.S. government requires nuclear plants here to be able to have on hand to compensate in the event of a nuclear accident by a factor of 10 or so. So uh, no, one, no one really has a good handle on how to, you know, honestly assess the total economic consequences and how to ensure that there will be fair compensation if that kind of event happens. I would say, you know, yeah, yeah, sorry. The question was, are the reactors at Fukushima now under control, or is there potential for an even worse disaster? So the, the thing about nuclear reactors is that once you shut them down, there is decay heat in the fuel for a long period of time, but that decay heat will does decrease over time. So the challenge of cooling the remaining fuel does uh, become less over time. So I think time is a is a you know a friend in this regard. Uh, there's always you know going to be a risk, and the system they have shut, uh, set up is very fragile. You know they have miles of, of uh, temporary piping which they're still relying on. There's also the the large and growing inventory of contaminated water in tanks which uh, some of the tanks have leaked. They, have to, uh, they built them uh, rapidly and they used uh, bolted tanks instead of uh, uh, ones that were welded. And um, so there's the potential if there's a very large natural event, another earthquake, some of that radioactive water can enter the environment. But the prospect of another large uh, radio atmospheric release, you know, a second meltdown leading to large heat generation explosion. It's probably very, very low probability. So, not that worried about it. Jim. And I wanted to ask about your view on the spent fuel, the ideal question about wet versus dry. And Fukushima, we had some of the spent fuel in the wet fuel storage and some of the dry gas. So, we have that here in the U.S. with slow shipping. Right, so the, the question is, um, what were the lessons of Fukushima with regard to spent fuel pool safety and our wet um, pools? Um, uh, what, what is the proper or the, the safe way of storage of spent fuel? So the, the issue with um, spent fuel storage in pools is that if you, in the United States in particular, um, because we don't have a 
strategy for getting spent fuel, which is the radioactive waste from nuclear power plants, off the sites um, that has been accumulating over decades. And so over time, the utilities have put more and more densely packed fuel into the same size spent fuel pools. And that's created an additional hazard, which wasn't necessarily present at Fukushima, is that if you had a sudden loss of the cooling water in the pool, and what these are actually swimming pool-like structures where the fuel is actually under 23 feet of water. But if there were a catastrophic breach of the pool liner, you could lose that water in a matter of hours. And because the fuel is densely packed in U.S. plants, there's a much shorter margin uh, to respond to that. And uh, there is the possibility of a of fire starting the pool, which could spread to a lot of the fuel assemblies. So we think that densely packed uh, fuel pools are a danger and that you should uh, transfer a lot of the fuel into what are called dry casks, which are structures that don't require cooling water. Each one has a much smaller amount of fuel in it so that uh, you don't have the uh, same amount of heat that you have to remove. So they can be passively cooled. And so you're subdividing that fuel into smaller packages in a passive way instead of having to have active cooling. We think that that is uh, safer. Unfortunately, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't agree with that. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't uh, have time to deal with it. But the um, the U.S. response to Fukushima is a program which the industry calls FLEX. And this is based on the idea that, again, you don't have to upgrade plants, uh, what they call install capacity, in other words, the uh, most robust uh, systems, but you can just have better emergency equipment and plans in place so that if you do have an accident and you lose core cooling, uh, you have better plans, more robust equipment, and you can actually more efficiently get water into the reactors before the cores actually start to melt. And so the, the industry's idea is that you, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. So you have to be prepared for anything. And you, the only way to do that is to be essentially prepared for nothing. That's sort of the strategy. Um, that you, you, you don't actually, you come up with some standards for how this equipment would be protected and used, but that doesn't actually have to correspond to any particular event. And we think that that is, uh, you know, you, you need to do both. You need to be flexible but you also need to make sure that in some of the scenarios you're really worried about that your plans and everything are going to work. And that's really the, uh, the challenge here. One of the things that's really inconsistent about the flex strategy is that the current standards uh, for how that equipment would be protected are that they don't have to be protected even as well as the rest of the reactor. So, in other words, if you had an accident which was worse than what the reactor was designed to withstand, not you would lose the reactor, but you'd also lose all the emergency equipment, and which doesn't make any sense, but that's what's been put into place. Uh, the French had a different strategy, which is that, again, you would have one set of emergency equipment, including an emergency diesel generator, which would be designed to a higher seismic and flooding standard than the rest of the plant so that you would have that available, you know, uh, you'd have a better chance of having it available, and we think that makes more sense. But the industry has been very reluctant to do that. Instead, they prefer diversity rather than redundancy. So if you're worried about a flood, you put one piece of equipment on a, on a elevated, you know, on top of the building, and if you're worried about an earthquake, you put another in the basement where, you know, so uh, that's diversity, but what about, you know, if you have common cause failures, it could take out both. That's what they don't want to deal with. Can you elaborate a little bit, sir, with your talk about comparing the Westinghouse design as well as the Flex? If you would be redesigning to be fit with the Westinghouse is more expensive. In the what if scenario, what would the nuclear generator fail with the Westinghouse design? What would you have a little bit more time? What would be the pressure aspect for the Yeah. 
in um, right the question was our Westinghouse uh, pressurized water reactor designs superior to boiling water reactor so the um, both types of reactor have roughly the same risk of core damage so uh, on, in broad terms so the chance of a meltdown occurring in either reactor is about roughly about the same um, so the Westinghouse reactors that have what are called large dry containments um, have a more greater passive response. So if you did have a meltdown, they have more capacity uh, to withstand increased pressure. So they would not have leaked as readily uh, as the boiling water reactor dry well did when you had a pressure increase. It would have, uh, they would have been able to accommodate much more, uh, much higher pressures. So those actually have um, a, a greater chance of protecting the public. Now, not every Westinghouse reactor has a large dry containment. There are actually 10, there are nine in the US and one under construction, which have a pressure suppression like the GE, except they use ice to uh, suppress steam rather than, um, than water. And so those are particularly vulnerable to containment failure and are not good designs. Yeah. At uh, Fukushima, the six reactors were sited side by side, and the spent fuel, uh, the uh, fuel pool that engineers would be working on top of the reactor vessels in that area, in terms of an engineering design, wouldn't that be a very poor design to have the fuel pool stand on the top of the reactors and have the reactors Yes, the uh, two aspects that are, yeah, yeah, sorry, this is a question about the design. Uh, Fukushima had multiple reactors that were closely located together, and they had spent fuel pools that were on the upper floors in the reactor buildings, and isn't that a um, poor engineering design? Well, yes, the reactors were pretty close together, and actually that did worsen the course of the accident because, you know, I didn't have a chance to mention this, but the unit one experienced a hydrogen explosion, which then affected uh, unit two. In fact, they were preparing a, an emergency. Unit two was um, in a better position than unit one was for a variety of reasons. So they were taking the time to assemble uh, a um, coolant path, you know, essentially laying tubing and also electrical wiring um, so that they would be able to deal with unit two when the crisis, uh, if a crisis erupted there. But unit one exploded and that damaged the equipment that they were assembling for unit two. It also um, blew a hole in the reactor building. Um, and so, so certainly having the reactors close together leads to coupling which can lead to a chain reaction. That's sort of what happened, or a domino effect. And so it doesn't make sense to, um, uh, to have such small separation between reactors. Definitely, that's a, a design issue. Um, now, with regard to the spent fuel pools, again, it made sense from an engineering standpoint to put the pools where they are in boiling water reactors if you're not worried about accidents, uh, which they weren't. But if you worry about have a situation where you have to get water, emergency water, into the pool because it was losing water, they, they learned that it's not a good idea to have the pool on the fifth floor of the building because how do you get emergency water into, you know, pipe pumping it up that distance? They tried to throw water into the pools from helicopters. That didn't work. They, uh, you know, they used riot cannons, you know, police uh, water cannons, which didn't work so well. It took uh, a couple of weeks before they got actually a concrete sprayer, which they pump, pump water through that, and that's sort of a, uh, they call it a giraffe, you know, has a long neck, and that actually was what they used to establish long-term mm -hmm. water uh, supply. So, yeah, uh, I think in the future it doesn't, make a lot of sense to have your spent fuel pool so inaccessible.
Thank you very much. Please join me to thank uh, Dr. Lyman. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.